meeting, chatting with uh, GF Jules, from, uh, who is Jules Shepard. If you haven't heard of her, she's an amazing advocate. She has her own gluten-free flour blend and baking mix line. Um, just an all-around great lady. Hey, Ashley, how are you? I see you like in a six. Hope you had, uh, love seeing pictures of that baby. So um, we're going to have Jules join us in just a second. So um, get ready with any questions you have about gluten-free baking. Uh, getting covered in a vomit. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> hey, friend. Hi. How are you? I am tired. <laughs> tired. I'm like I shouldn't ask. It. Like I know what's going on in your life. That's like a loaded question right now. Like, how are you? Like, do you really want to know? <laughs> uh, I, I, am I close enough? I feel like I just I did a cooking video earlier today, and so I just still had it all set up, and I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm really far away now. Um, but you do look a little far away, but you know what? If you don't want to move things, that's all right. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. As like long you as do you what works. Right? Am I, I can totally totally hear you. You hear me? Okay, good. That's good. Yep. So, hey. And I can see your beautiful flowers and oranges or mandarins. Like you have like cool stuff on your kitchen yeah, counter. That's we do smoothies every day, so we have all that. The flowers are, you know, that's, you know what that's yeah. for, so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but that's all right. Hi, Kaylee, how are you? You're going to know all a lot more of these people than I do. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, well. I'll have new people I to say hi on, to. Yeah, I hopped on really quick and just said, hey, guys, I'm going, you know, live really quick with, uh, with Margaret, but I, I didn't even have time to share it earlier, so I felt really bad. So everybody oh, say to everyone else that we're live because I didn't have time to say anything. <laughs> it's okay. Well, and, and I even tagged you, like, you know, how, like, Instagram has, like, the mention, like, sticker. And, oh, like, yeah. I don't – and I put it there, but I don't think it worked. Like, I think Instagram is having, like, a bad day or something. I don't know. <laughs> so it's not just me that's having a bad day? No. Like, because, like, usually, even when I post something and, like, do, like, the colorful, you know, multicolor tag thing, like, yeah. I can push it myself and it'll take me to whatever account. Nope, it wouldn't do that when I posted with you yesterday, earlier today, so who knows. So I apologize if I did it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I should have tagged you. You did more than I did, so I feel bad for not doing it earlier, but mm -hmm. hi, everybody who's, who's on there. It was nice to see you guys. Wait, you know what? Let me just go get my pie. I'll show you what I did the cooking <gasps> earlier hold on one yum yeah so and hi this, jonathan and erica i saw those two yeah, I saw are that. watching this is the pie that i made oh. here it's strawberry rhubarb pie and um so yeah i'm gonna i'm i'm showing the video tomorrow i'm gonna do a, a facebook premiere and i'm gonna do it on youtube as well so there we go oh i made my seat higher this is better now i don't feel like i'm two feet tall <laughs> anyway <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I've never done the premiere because I usually, hi, everybody, um, I usually do it, you know, live so I, and I, I can answer questions while I'm doing it. But I always feel like, I'm like, hey, what, I can't read what people <laughs> say. And so what I'm going to do is, um, is post it and sit there and answer people's questions while it's going and try it that way. So anyway, it's so interesting. That's our church does it that way now because of COVID, obviously. So um, I figured, you know what? If my church can pull it off, I can pull it off. Right? So, so that's on Facebook or on YouTube? Um, I'm going to do it both because oh. you, the way Facebook works is it you have to do it. It, it can't have been put anywhere else first. So oh. you post it on Facebook, and then a few minutes later, you can post it on YouTube. So... I can hop back and forth and answer questions. You can premiere it on YouTube, at, um, you know, right after you've put, started premiering it on Facebook. And I think that's interesting because I have a friend that he does funny videos. He's a comedian. And he, it's the first time I've ever seen that he launched, he's doing a video and he's premiering it. And I was like, what is that? So this is my daughter. Say hi. hi. And everybody, hi. everybody, this is Hallie. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Did she, did she just have a birthday? Do I remember that? In no. March, yeah. She had in March. Okay, then I'm clueless then. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know what day it is anymore, much less what month. So, you know, yeah. But 
Anyway, so yeah, she just walked in, so I just made her come in and say hi. So <laughs> that's okay. That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that'll be tomorrow. I think we're doing it at four tomorrow, and it's going to be all about um, pies, making um, pie uh, pastries. And I, what I realized was I've done so many cooking videos of making pie pastries that, and I've posted them on various uh, places on my my recipes that it almost makes it look like making pastry is hard because I've made so many videos that it's like, oh, this is overwhelming because there's too many videos. So I think I'm going to take down all of the other videos and just say, okay, here's the video showing how to make pastry. It's really Mm -hmm. not. It's like 30 minutes and I've showed you everything from start to finish and it's really not hard at all. It's really easy. I like your new helmet. She just got a new bike. Where oh, are your cool. Everyone. Yes. So it looks good. My husband does. Or yeah. he did until his bike broke, and then we still never fixed it. So we just have two bikes in our garage that we never use because they don't work. <laughs> well, yeah, you don't actually need a helmet if you're not riding a bike. Right. True. So somebody asked a question on Facebook, on my Facebook page, and they said, see, now my. Let's see if my computer will turn back on. Nope, it won't because my computer's dumb. Let's see. Because I have my, my laptop like underneath. Oh, wait, maybe it will work. You just tell it like it is. My computer's dumb. It is. That's like, the way I feel. All technology is great except for when it's not. Yeah. Um, basically, the person was asking. Here, I got it to pull up. I've heard that lemon juice and baking powder in equal amounts can be used as a substitute for yeast. Have you heard this? She said, we tried this and it didn't go well. Are there any other yeast substitutes to consider? Okay. Great question. Um, I feel like I should let my hair down. (laughs) All right. It's time to get real. We're talking about yeast. Um, Okay. So uh, at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, I got so many questions about what do I do if I can't find yeast that I did a couple of, um, I did... Actually, here on Instagram, on my Instagram page, I have a video, a super short video of how to make your own baking powder because people couldn't find baking powder. And I also did a video on yeast. And I put up on my, at gfjewels.com on my blog, I put up, uh, I had already had a post all about yeast, but I, I, I've, refreshed it and put a whole bunch more information and then I think you actually shared the other day I did for sharing I shared that I think actually I think it was like a month ago but again time does not exist but today I shared your I think it was the yeastless bread recipe I shared today on Facebook Uh, I went back through my recipes and I was like I actually have 11 bread recipes on gftools.com that don't call for yeast like I mean they're yeastless bread recipes either Mm -hmm. now like pita breads or or other bread recipes that uh, have workarounds that you know like yeastless dinner roll recipes um so you know for people who can't find yeast but back to the original question um or can't use yeast for one reason or another um the i refreshed that whole post on yeast and i talked about what do you do to make your own substitute and of course one great one is sourdough which is super popular mm-hmm have a gluten-free sourdough starter recipe as well as the sourdough um, recipe but to do it's not like a one-to-one you can't just say well I'm going to use baking soda and something else to make yeast that's not going to work because you're talking about a chemical leavener versus a yeast which is a a creature it's like a living organism so it, it ultimately what you're trying to do is to create leavening in something so you're trying to create you know, the, ca- the carbon dioxide bubbles that give lift to the, the you know, the bread usually is what you're trying mm-hmm. to do. You want some, some air pockets in. Um, so it's one or the other. You're doing chemical or you're doing this, you know, living organism type of thing. So they're going to have a different taste. They're going to have a different texture and structure. And so you want to do one or the other. But if you're you can't do yeast and you want to do something else, you can go to the chemical leaveners instead. The baking soda and... and um, Lemon juice, she said. 
is an option I've heard of. What I had proposed instead and what the video does that I have on my Instagram page as well as on the blog, um, she, my daughter just came back in for her face mask. This is a brave new world, isn't it? They just mm -hmm. left, needed a face mask. Um, what I proposed instead was a, cre a cream of tartar and baking soda together instead mm. to make baking powder. And then you use that combination to stand in as a standalone product that you can use then in a recipe to, to provide that lift. Basically, you need an acid and a base together, and not all recipes already have that in it. So if a recipe mm -hmm. called baking powder, that means that the recipe itself didn't have that combination in it. If the recipe calls for baking soda, then somewhere else in the recipe already had the acid in it. Like a, um, you know, might have a butter buttermilk, something else in there that, that already will activate. So you have to do what the recipe says, or you have to have a workaround. So I don't love the lemon juice as much as the cream of tartar answer to that equation, but it's not going to taste the same and it's not going to, can't just say, oh, I'm going to just slap that in there and use it exactly in the same proportions as yeast and expect it to okay. work exactly the same. But there are some workarounds and there are some things that you can do. In the recipes, like for example, my pizza recipe calls for yeast, but if you read the end of the recipe, there's a yeast less workaround for it. And you use the chemical leaveners, and then instead of using regular milk or water, you use bubbly water or, um, you know, something like ginger ale or something else that adds some other lift to it as well. So maybe what your reader is asking in that particular recipe, maybe if she had done that combination and instead mm. whatever the liquid in the recipe was, maybe added some extra lift by adding mm. bubbly water, maybe that would have helped. And also, you probably need to add extra of that chemical leavener, not right. just exactly the same amount as she would have been using the yeast, because it's going to need a little oomph, a little more of that oomph than she would have gotten. Right. And usually when I think of, like, baking powder and, like, vinegar or lemon juice, I think of replacing, like, an egg. Like, I think of, like, the wacky cake type recipes. I don't think of that as, like, using that in bread. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's going to taste different. Mm -hmm. It's just... It's just a little different, but you know, you can do it. It's just, we got to get creative right. in these. Times. Right. Right. Yeah. So just real quick for people that are just joining, like I see, um, Caroline, I'm going to butcher yes, Caroline. Caroline. <laughs> I've, have you been seeing her Facebook posts about, uh, her notifications from her dad? It's like every day, like, cause her dad lives in a nursing home and she takes him stuff. And then it's like this funny story that I'm like, oh my gosh, I live for these. They're hilarious. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> but, um. But for everybody who's just joining in, I'm, I'm talking with Jules Shepard from GF Jewels. If you don't know about her, she's an amazing advocate. She has her own gluten-free flour and baking mix line. She does a podcast. She has a website with recipes. She's kind of just amazing. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. And and Jules and I were trying to, well, Jules is the baking expert, not me. So <laughs> I'll end up asking her. But if you have any questions, please drop them there. And, um, and I'll try to upload this to YouTube later, and you can ask questions there later, and, and I'll shoot them off to her i guess jules is wicked brilliant yes she is oh, yes she you. is <laughs> love you it's good to see you up there i we yeah. had a, a little group chat earlier when this whole covid thing happened and, and yeah it was it was different <laughs> um this is this has been an interesting situation for everybody just trying to get their sea legs but um it's good to see friends you know connected. it is but this is fun thank you for putting this together margaret this has been this yeah has been. you're welcome so how is how is business going like are you able to keep up with demand for flour yeah it's i i feel so blessed that we are in a position you know the, our company has always been in the business you call it direct to consumer as opposed to mm -hmm. uh, you know, retail. So mm -hmm. we are not on store shelves. We never have been. I mean, we're in a few stores where customers mm -hmm. really have wanted us to be on their local mom and pop um, stores and have asked. And of course, we work with those stores and are happy to, to do that. But that's not our primary business model because what we've always mm -hmm. wanted to do is to bring our products to people no matter where they live. So it doesn't matter if you live in Missoula or if you 
live in Alaska or Hawaii or New York City, we want to make sure that people have the same access to our products. So mm-hmm. we worked really hard to um, ensure that the supply chain and the, the distribution, which is essentially, you know, UPS, FedEx, USPS, is equal. And so anyone can have access to our products. So that was already you know, established before all of this happened. So a lot of the brands that people are familiar with, that's not their business model. Their business model has been, you know, they're on store shelves. Mm-hmm. So when this all happened, you know, we were already set up to help people who needed access to um, certified gluten-free, made in a dedicated facility, top eight free, you know, foods. And that's what we do. And we were already mm-hmm. like that. Um, so yes, we were there and ready. And then we also had just, um, we, we produce very often and we, we produce in a, um, in a facility that has been very, very nimble and, and has been very at ready to help us. It's been amazing. They, they, we literally, Margaret have been producing flour every single week in this whole production. I mean, this whole COVID thing, we've been producing everything. I've never been in this situation before, obviously. Is that more than usual? Oh my gosh. I mean, we always produce, we, we try to produce in smaller amounts more frequently so that everything that we get fresh. is fresh. And um, I mean, our shelf life is, we have, we have best buy dates. We don't have expiration dates. Mm-hmm. I stuff like way longer than the best buy dates, but um, it's 18 months for all of our products. So it's not going to go bad like anytime soon anyway, but we try to keep stuff, you know, fresh anyway. But um, we have, we typically produce once a month, once, once every six to eight weeks, something like that, just depending. And of course, certain seasonal things, you know, mm-hmm. obviously, as you gear up for Thanksgiving and the holidays and things we're we're producing much more. And then in the late spring and the summer, not producing very much um, then because people aren't baking as much. So it's a very much more of a seasonal type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But we had just produced and, you know, restocked after the holidays and we were in Canada now as well. And so we had just, you know, produced our, uh, our bilingual labeled products and things and, and shipped those to Canada and then all this stuff hit and thank goodness, because, you know, then we ran out like, like, ah, whatever. And we were able to restock. So we had, um, we did run out in Canada for a period of time, but other than that, our, between our production facility and our fulfillment center, we have not really run out of products. We, we have on Amazon, but between, you know, because people can buy through our website at gfjewels.com mm-hmm. or they can buy on Amazon. So we have run out on Amazon because the restocking time on Amazon, you can't control that. Like we've right. had products sitting in Amazon and they've said out of stock, we don't know when or if this product is ever going to be available again. I'm like, it's sitting in your warehouse, <laughs> like, but you can't yeah. tell Amazon to you know, change their messaging. You can't control that. Um, but the people have still been able to come to our website and get it. Mm-hmm. So we haven't really run out of stock on anything. So that's good. We haven't been able, you know, we haven't let anyone down in that regard. It's been a little bit different in Canada just because getting stuff over the border, I mean, you know, that's just a hassle and half. Um, but we've had three stops since then and, and we're back. So but yeah. well, and, and like living in Michigan, like the borders closed, like, I mean, except for like essential workers coming back from Detroit and Windsor, like you're yeah. not allowed to cross. And I think the same in Port Huron to Sarnia, like there's just, unless you are an essential worker and have a job that you need yeah. to be there, like, nope, yeah. you don't get to come in right now. Right. So I can understand well, how that makes it hard like for shipping. Are, are considered essential, obviously, in their food. And, and right. even more than that, like, I would argue if they're, if, if there was an argument to be made and there's not, luckily they, they're like, Oh yeah, totally. You're essential. But, um, you know, our products are even more central because they're, right. they're top eight allergen free right. and they're, they're gluten free products. So they're even more essential to people because they're, you know, they're, medical, right. free, but they're, they are still considered essential products. So we haven't had any problems getting them over the border, but, um, just in terms of all of the, the paperwork, just, mm. the, that it takes to get stuff and just the amount of money it, that it takes is just it's ridiculous to what it takes to get stuff it's just insane. 
Yes. Well, I'm so glad that, because I know that the flowers that I tend to buy around here, because I am terrible about ordering things and planning ahead. So that's why I'm not an orderer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh crap, I'm out right now. I need to go to the store, which has been really hard during coronavirus. I'm like, I'm like having to plan farther in advance. Like, okay, this is when we, we try to do it only once every two weeks, but that's not always yeah, no, possible. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a mind shift. Like everyone has to think differently now, right? I mean, you have mm-hmm. to just think. All right. Um, I guess I'm going to have to place a big order for lots of stuff all at one time. And mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people have thought that way, um, you know, in the past. And somebody posted here on Instagram. It's hilarious. I'm going to, I'm going to reshare it just because I just thought it was so funny. And she posted, she said, help me GF tools. And she posted a picture of a cake that she made. It's beautiful. Like this three layer cake made out of watermelon. And she said she wow. ran out of gluten-free flour. <laughs> she, said, oh. she said, help me, she have tools, I'm out of flour. And she had to make a cake out of watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But yeah, I mean, it's just like, you really have to think in advance. Like, you really have to think, okay. And the other thing we can't control is, you know, we have flour. We are shipping it out. But we have no control over how long it takes UPS or whoever to get it there. Right. Like, and, and a lot of our customers are like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe how fast this got there. But mm-hmm. other times, it's not. And you don't have any idea. Right. Like, the luck of the draw. You know, with that. And I think it's getting better. I think in the beginning of all this craziness, it was like, you know, God only knows how long it's going to take to get there. But I think, I think things are starting to settle down and, and things are, you know, getting a little bit more. Um, regular <laughs> if uh-huh. you will, in terms of how long it takes to get there but um we ship internationally as well and we have a store we ship to in singapore that, wow. um, that we've tried to you know really keep in stock as well because we have a lot of a lot of customers in new zealand and australia um, in particular who you know we try to keep this one store in singapore in stock because I direct customers all the time to them because they can ship from Singapore so much more reasonably, obviously, than we can from here so that people can order from there and, you know, ship directly. So it's just, you know, just trying to help people get access to safe, reliable, right. trusted, you know, excellent products so that they can make good food, you know? Well, that's amazing. I didn't know about... New Zealand and Australia. That's cool. I have to let people know that if they're from New Zealand, I'm like, well, you should try GF Tools Flower. <laughs> well, I mean, we do. We ship everywhere. I mean, it, obviously, international shipping is expensive, but right. um, what I have learned is that the first, I don't know, like five to 10 pounds is the most expensive. And so after mm. that, like, throw whatever you want to in the box and like, it just doesn't really get that much more expensive after that. So a lot of people will, you know, join with friends or family and they'll order a bunch of stuff and then it becomes a lot less expensive, you know, proportionately. Mm -hmm. Uh, And not just for my products, for anything that you want to order. Yeah. I know, Caroline, isn't it amazing? Like the stuff that you learn (laughs) when you're trying to figure this out. We get get questions every day from people around the world, like, you know, do you ship here? Do you ship there? Um, Yeah. I mean, that's what we had to figure it out. And, and in fact, even the beginning of this, we were using a different shipper and it was just a ridiculous process. And we just pushed our shipping fulfillment partner, like, figure this out. You have to get this better. You have to get the prices better. You have to get it more, you know, it was taking like a month to get stuff places. It was like this, come on, like this can't be what's really happening in 2020. Mm-hmm. So now it's like much more reasonable. It's, you know, week to two weeks um, to get places you know to around the world like it's supposed to and you know it's it costs what it costs it's not mm-hmm. so it's expensive anymore but you just people who who order internationally they know like what it costs and they know how to figure out the system and they know, you know what it takes but basically it's once you get to that 10 pound threshold you just keep adding to your box and it doesn't get that much more expensive so then when you sort of amortize that over everything in the box. It's not that outrageously expensive. And so if you can join with other people or if you just figure, you know, well, the shelf life is is really long on these products, then, you know, heck, I'll just buy a bunch of it and I'll keep it around for a while. That makes sense. 
but especially in New Zealand and Australia, in that area, if you know that there's a store in Singapore that carries it, and that's much closer, and the ship is much more reasonable. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So do you, um, for those who are new to gluten-free baking, if you had like two or three top tips, what would they be? I, mean, I know yeah. you're like, only what? <laughs> How am I supposed to distill this down? Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like the tips are categorized. Like, do you want bread baking tips, cookie baking tips, pie baking tips? Like, I don't know. I mean, I, for me, I mean, what so I, Give us your best cookie baking tip then. I think I'm a cookie monster. I will eat every cookie in the house. Okay. <laughs> cookie baking tips. Um, parchment paper is your friend. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't ever bake cookies without parchment anymore. I, I just think, you know, first of all, I, I think when you put, when you put cookies on a cookie sheet and then there's that oily residue, I just, I, I don't like that anymore. Like, I just don't like, you. I don't want that at all. But like, and then you have to grease the cookie sheet so it gets even greasy. Like, anyway, plus when the, especially gluten-free cookies, when they come out, sometimes they're, when they're hot, they're even more fragile. And so if you try to get them mm-hmm. off the cookie sheet, then they fall apart. But you need to get them off the cookie sheet because then they keep cooking, you know, mm-hmm. unless they're really crunchy. So then they keep cooking. So you have to get them off the cookie sheet. Then they fall apart. So anyway, parchment paper. Um, Caroline's I, asking, do you have a favorite brand of parchment paper? <laughs> um, I... I mean, I like If You Care and, you know, all of the unbleached parchments. I like those. Um, but, of course, for food photography, the unbleached parchment doesn't look very pretty. So then I have to change to the bleached parchment. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they're it, not particularly. I don't like the Reynolds, the ones with the lines in them, just because I don't like the lines. They annoy me. But, right. Because then I always feel like they don't line up right. I'm kind of. <laughs> I don't tweak you like that, but they're same. You know, as long as they're not, you know, um, if they're if they're non-stick, then they're coated with something. I don't want that. Like I just want paper, you know. Um, but yeah, parchment paper always because then you don't have to spray them with anything. There's no added oil. You can just lift the parchment off and just put it somewhere else, and they can cool, and then they're beautiful, and um, and and then and you can reuse the parchment like once it's mm-hmm. cool, just. You know, uh, yeah, the unbleached um, Carolina. I think that's perfect. I love that. And I use it for everything else. Like, I just made focaccia yesterday, and I, I lined my um, my sheet with the focaccia with the parchment paper. And, and, and I also love parchment paper for when I'm traveling or, like, go over to a friend's house or something like that, and I want to use their pans or something. Then I don't have to worry about, did this pan have gluten on it, or is it clean, or, you know, what? Because then it's just, I put my parchment down and then I'm good to go. And, and then I don't have to feel like I'm asking all these questions or I'm like, can I just wash your pan again? Or like, just <laughs> put the parchment down, you know what I mean? And so it's just, I love parchment. <laughs> so, I yeah. use it for a lot of things. I use it for brownies. I mean, I'll line even loaf pans. I'm like, it's just so yeah. much easier to get out and clean. I, mean, and- yeah, I know, right? And for even for like cakes or anything. Yeah, I just, I love parchment. So um, there's a cookie tip for you. Um, I'm trying to think. I I like. Um, I for, do you always chill your cookie dough? I don't because I'm you in don't. a cake. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you do. You chill your cookie dough if you have to. Obviously, if you're having a problem with your cookies spreading too much or whatever, yeah, obviously throw it in the fridge or the freezer. Um, because then, you know, it, it needs to sort of set up and needs to, um, the soak in, you know, the flour and the, and the fat needs to come together and a happy marriage there. But, um, the, the other thing is if, if you're having a problem, <laughs> I know, I don't, I, I, Hey, Erica, I'm, I'm impatient and I have a short attention <laughs> span and I'm always late. So, you know, that <laughs> So I was like, Oh crap, I need to, um, I'm late for wherever I was supposed to go and I was supposed to have already made the cookies, so I don't have time to chill the dough. Uh, but I can tell you that, um, I always have cookie dough in the freezer because I, I usually am late and so I, I don't have time to make all the cookies, so I throw cookie dough in the freezer. So I will make cookie dough and I'll, I'll just make the cookies, make what I need to make, and then I'll, I'll either 
put cookie dough in the freezer, either in balls, like, you know, so that they're ready to go for next time, or I'll make a log and do slice and bake, you know, for, for later, or I'll just put cookie dough in a, in a bag or whatever. That's, I mean, so handy to have cookie dough um, ready to go. Um, and, but then if you're having problems with your cookies, like let's say they're spreading and it's just a disaster or whatever, just line up an eight by eight pan with your parchment paper and throw the cookie dough in there and turn them into bar cookies because mm-hmm. that will fix almost every problem. It'll hold them all in there. And then once they set up after they cool, it's probably going to be fine and you know they might not be the prettiest thing in the world but you can always eat them with a spoon and at least you're not throwing them away and they'll probably taste good and as everybody always knows you know it's like taste is king right it doesn't matter what they look like as long as it tastes good so if at the end of the day if you know if it still doesn't work you can always just put them in a pan or yeah. a lot of people will say well i just kept adding flour and adding flour and adding flour well that works to a certain extent, but sometimes you're just, you know, throwing good ingredients after a bad mm. recipe. And that doesn't always fix it. So my first inclination, unless like a quarter cup of flour doesn't fix it, I just put my bar cookies out of it. Good to know. I like that tip. Yeah. What's your, and I won't ask Thai stuff because I'm going to direct people to go watch your video. Yes. That you're going to have tomorrow on your Facebook page and on YouTube at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So best bread baking tip, but for people that can't find gluten-free bread at the store and they're making bread at home, maybe one or two top tips. Okay. Well, first of all, the, the biggest overarching tip of everything is that a lot of people get super frustrated that they they can't bake anything gluten-free, cookies, bread, pie, whatever, and it's all terrible and whatever. And it, it honestly comes down to the flour that they're mm-hmm. using. And and I tell people this all the time. There was this lovely person who was talking about gluten-free tortillas. It was right before um, Cinco de Mayo. And she said she had just about given up on making flour tortillas for her family. And she was so sad because they, they really wanted gluten-free flour tortillas. They love flour. And I said, please just, just try making them with my flour because I promise you, you know, you will love them and don't give up on this. And it's not you, it's the flour. Because if you think about any recipe, be it cookies, be it bread, pie, it doesn't matter what it is. What is the main ingredient in any of those things? It's flour. And if you're using a flour that is, you know, dry or crumbly or tastes funny or smells funny or whatever, it's not, it's going to mess up your recipe. And then in gluten-free, there's so many different types of flours out there. In gluten baking, there really isn't. I mean, most people mm-hmm. just go and buy, you know, whatever brand it is. It could be gold metal flour. It could be Safeway. It could be Kroger. They're all the same. It's, it's you know, all-purpose white flour. And it right. really is all the same. In gluten-free, they are all totally different. Even if you turn over the label and it kind of looks the same, the proportions may be totally different or the individual raw ingredients may be totally different. I mean, you could look at the ingredients on my label and you could think I can make that. You cannot make that. Like literally the, the percentages are so finely tuned and the individual ingredients are so like, so, so, so specific. Even like it says tapioca starch on here. There are three tapioca starches in here, like three. Wow. Yeah, like you wouldn't know that. And they're so, so specific. And they're like, they're in there specifically for specific, 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 specific reasons. And they do specific things. And you couldn't even buy those. If you tried to find those, you couldn't buy them because they're not available to consumers. They're like math, you know, they're manufacturing, mm-hmm. whatever. So there's no way that you could possibly find them. So how how is it that, a person could, you know, try everything out there and know that they, that they have succeeded. They couldn't. So try something else. Try a different flower. It's not you. It's probably the flower that you're using. So I, I said to this woman with the tortillas, I was like, please just, just try it. I know that this flower works in these tortilla recipes and you will love it. And she, and she wrote back, she's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for 
encouraging me to try this your flower with these tortillas because my family loved them and it was great and we had this you know we we finally had tortillas again it was amazing whatever and and I, and I'm not trying to say like you know my flower hung the moon or whatever I obviously love it and I and I think that it's fantastic and it works great in in my baking and, and that's fantastic for me and for lots of other people it might not be the right one for you but I encourage people not to give up because it's you know flour is the ingredient that makes right. all baking work or fail so if right. you're not having success please don't give up please try something else because it really probably isn't you it's probably mm-hmm. the flour that you're using so look around read reviews talk to other people about what they're using and find something else because it really you know you, you just i don't want people to give up because right you have to be bad it really can be amazingly yummy and really, really good so to your bread question you have to find the right flour because if you're mm-hmm. using a funky flour, a heavy flour, dense flour, you're going to find that your bread is dense. It's funky. It smells funny. It tastes funny, whatever, because that's the flour that you're using. Not all flours are made for making bread. And right. so you really have to do your homework on finding the right flour for bread. Once you found that and you found a good recipe, and that's why reviews are so helpful. Um, and I encourage people to really, you know, take stock of in what pe- other people who have made that recipe say or made mm-hmm. that mix say, because they're just like you, like they're out there baking and, and, um, and trying recipes too. You know, like see what they say and see if they think that it's a really good recipe and then join these Facebook groups or, you know, read other people's reviews about what they've said about the, the recipe. Because that's the only way to know for sure. You know, you can't go to just some brand and say, you know, that they're obviously going to say that they're whatever is the best. (laughs) Rely on other people to say, you know, whether it's any good or not. Um, With regard to bread in general, I love baking gluten-free bread because it's easier than baking gluten bread. It's faster than baking gluten bread. It doesn't take any fancy techniques or any fancy skills. I often just rely on um, on the quick rise yeast. You don't have to knead it. In fact, you shouldn't knead the bread. There's no punch down, second rise, nothing. You don't need a bread machine, but you can use a bread machine if you want one. Uh, I have a, a really detailed article on my website at GF Jewels about using a gluten-free bread machine, or if you have one that doesn't have a gluten-free setting, how to program your bread machine, the bread machines that I like that have gluten-free settings. But most of the time I end up just using my oven without a bread machine. If you're more comfortable using a bread machine, then that's what you should do. Um, It's cheaper. It's, it is amazing to have the smell of fresh baked bread. You know this, Margaret, like, to fill your house mm-hmm. with smell of fresh baked bread, um, it's amazing. So I, if you've never baked bread, I think it's really empowering. And if you're ever going to learn how to do it, why not do it now when we're all stuck inside with nothing else to do and you probably can't find gluten-free bread anyway? There's so many different options out there. And focaccia, like I mentioned earlier, oh my gosh, you just bake it on a cookie sheet. It takes mm-hmm. 10 minutes to bake it. 10 minutes, Margaret. It's so Mm -hmm. easy. Anybody can make it. Like, so find a recipe like that. Start with something like that. It's super easy. And like, get your, get your groove, you know, like I did that. I made that. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. I'm a rock star. I just baked bread. Like, and then you can just start experimenting and and go, I can make that too. And I can make Mm -hmm. that too. And and, and then when this is all over, because eventually this will all be over then maybe you go, I'm not going to buy that store-bought stuff anymore because this is so much better and it was really easy and it was less expensive and my family actually all liked it, even though they're not gluten-free. And, you know, so it's, it might start, you might start connecting the dots and realizing that it actually is kind of pretty cool to make your own bread. Was that a long For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I, no, no, I'm sorry. Like, I don't 
I have a dog that doesn't sleep well. So like I'm up half. She'll okay. We've started this terrible tradition of tucking her in a bed at night. The dog, not a kid, a dog. And if she gets untucked, she will wake you up in the middle of the night to tuck her back in. I am not even kidding. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, like at two in the morning, she'll be, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, go lay down. I'll cover you back up. So. You need an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any kids, so I, she's my kid. So I just give yes, in. You officially have a kid. <laughs> yes. Real quick, though, you said you use. Did you say quick rise yeast? So I've always used the active yeast that you have to proof first with water. So you use the quick yeast that you don't have to proof ahead of time? Yep. And so that's interchangeable, right? Like, I mean, if I, the recipes, so the recipes that I've used where I've proofed yeast before, like I could just not proof it and throw it in, right? Is that, am I understanding correctly? If you're using active yeast, if you're using just the regular active yeast, you still have to proof that. Right. No, but I'm saying if I have, because my husband, bless his heart, went and got yeast for me, but it, none of it was active yeast. So I'm like, okay, now how do I use this quick yeast instead? Uh, now, again, that the article I told you about that I wrote all about yeast at gftools.com, mm-hmm blog if you type in just like yeast on the search bar it'll come up with that article it talks about the differences between the yeast if you're using the active yeast you do have to proof it if you're using the quick rise yeast you do not have to proof it you just throw it in with your with, with the other ingredients and make sure it, it mixes up really really well so it's distributed mm-hmm. well it is absorbed right um but the um the proportions are the same. The packet sizes are the same. It's two and a quarter teaspoons mm-hmm. yeast. But um, you you basically, you know, you don't have to sit and wait for it to activate. Um, Which is nice because, like, so here here in Flint, because we still have to have filtered tap water, like, we still have to go through, jump through all those hoops. Like, I, and you're not allowed to use it with your hot water. So I have to like run cold water, then warm it up. Warm then it it's up. always too hot. So then I have to wait till it gets to between 105 and 110. I'm like, if you're telling me there's a faster, easier way, I got to try it because yeah. I'm tired of yes. temping my water. But for gluten-free, you can. For most recipes, you can. You can do that because, because you're not, you don't have to let it do this whole rigmarole about, you know, like letting it rise and punching it down and then letting it rise again and all that kind of stuff. Um, the quick rise yeast lets you get away with like avoiding all that time. So you can just sort of do it that way. The other thing that, and, and when I say you don't have to do that stuff, I mean, don't do it. Do not, okay. do not, do not punch down your gluten-free bread and do a second rise because you will kill it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't emphasize that enough. You will get one rise out of your gluten-free bread. That whole thing about punching it down and laying it around, that is to exercise the gluten and to stretch it out and all that kind of stuff. If you do that, you're taking all of the, the rise that you've just gotten out of the yeast, and you're just going, and it's not coming back because, because there's no gluten to stretch and, like, give it back. So you need to just do it once. And so if you have something like a challah bread or like a cinnamon roll or something that's shaped like a crescent roll or anything like that, it has to be shaped and then risen in order to be the most successful, like happy, shaped, uh, fluffy, risen, gluten-free bread that you have. So don't let the dough rise and then shape it and rise again is what you're saying. No. Because that's what I've been doing. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So to read on my blog, there is the 18 top tips for gluten-free bread baking. Okay. Well, now I will have to try that because my crescent rolls is probably one of my biggest um, traffic makers from Pinterest to my site. And so it's like, let the dough rest for 90 minutes, then shape them, then let them rise again. So now I need to try them I- again. Yeah, I think if, if you do it again and try it this way, I think you'll find that they'll rise even higher and be fluffy. 
Okay. Well, thank you. That was... Yeah. That makes a world of difference. Yeah. Who wouldn't want fluffier crescent rolls? I know, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think, too, like, I have butter in mine, so I think I was going to try it again, too, and see about, like, kind of like how you do with pie crust, like, cutting it in, because when then, you know, that creates air pockets when the butter melts, so I'm yeah. thinking, okay, maybe I need to try a few changes. But Yeah, I get into all of that, um, and you'll see tomorrow in the video, the pie crust making video, I get into all of that about the air pockets and keeping your butter nice and cold and all that kind of stuff. So same principle um, with the crescent rolls, with anything like that. It's the same, exactly the same thing. I do that with my pastry, with anything like that, working that in. Um, you want to keep it, you know, nice and cold, not overwork the dough and yeah. Mm -hmm. You're amazing. Yeah. Well, those are most of my questions. And if there's anything else you want to share, I don't want to keep up, take up too much of your time. But um, if there's anybody else that's watching that has questions, please feel free to chime in. But I'm just, just glad that you're doing okay. And um, mm -hmm. given everything, you know, everything on top of everything, especially for you lately, it seems like. But um just thanks for your tips and your willingness to be an advocate. And, you know, I still think of you as, you know, the, the cake and the 100, 133 and all that you've done just, just in the beginning, even just to be an advocate and all that you've done for the celiac community is just huge and phenomenal. And I'm just honored that I'm your friend. <laughs> so Thank you. Likewise. You're I, welcome. I love you so much. You're such a sweet oh. person. You have just, you do so much every day for the gluten-free community as well. And I just, I love that we've gotten to know each other over the years. And I just, you're such a special person in my heart. So I appreciate Aww. you inviting me to be a part of your, um, your month of, you know, celiac talks. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you for, yeah, isn't she a rock star? I forget too. I love her. No, I think she's talking about you. I think she's talking about you. <laughs> I, I know. I, she, you, you really are. I um, I was talking to Erica, so I can be today, and um, I was just saying, I've, I've just, I've, I've, it's just been such a busy, busy month for me lately with some other stuff, but um, I haven't had a chance to share all this content that is on my site, and it's Celiac Awareness Month, you know, and yeah, mm -hmm. I've been for a long time and I, I really I, I want facts to get out there I want you know hardcore information to get out there I want people to know the the facts the truth the you know tested time tested right and um you know interviews with Dr. Fasano you know like all of that stuff that's on my site and I just I haven't had the chance to share it like I should this month in particular and I feel like it's it's hard anymore with a lot of the newer um, people joining in, you know, on social media in particular, it's hard for people to tell the difference between, you know, yes. out there saying, you know, yes. oh, you can eat this protein bar or whatever, and people who know what they're talking about, you know, how, how, how is it, especially people who are new to the community, how, how can they tell the difference? How do they know, like, mm -hmm. what? actually know what they're talking about <laughs> how do they how do they tell the difference and that that's part of our job too I think is to be able mm -hmm. to you know point out other people who are trusted sources because right you know that's it's important to know who to rely on and who to go to because that's that's the only way for people to stay safe is to know who they can trust not just for recipes but for how to read gluten-free labels, you know, how to find, um, you know, reliable sources for reporting to the FDA, you know, how to, right. you know, how to go to the grocery store and shop safely. Like it, all of that stuff is really important. And if you're just following bloggers who, you know, are, you know, whatever, taking pictures in front of, you know, restaurants with bagels or whatever. <laughs> right. Well, and even on the other side, like I shared, um, like I've been redoing some of my old posts with like new images now that I understand what Canva is and how awesome it is. <laughs> so, um, but like I updated a post and there was, and it, I took an image from a different site and of course gave them proper credit and linked back, but it was an explanation of like, how is a nutritionist different than a dietitian? 
And like, who are you getting your medical information from? Because a lot of these terms, like, well, what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist and a health coach? And like, who are you going to for your medical and health information and make sure you understand because they're not all the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. It's a really good point. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading that post. I will send you the link. It's an old post and I just had updated it with new pictures. I'll send you the link, but it was a really good. And the, and the person that shared it, they were a dietitian. So they were a medical practice that could be trusted because they've done the time and the study and all that stuff. So yeah, we need to make sure we share from reputable resources. Yeah, totally. For right. sure. Look at that. Well, you have a great night and thank you for your time and hello to your husband and children and mom and dad and everybody else. I get a house. So, so. yes. Six house seven. party at the Sh Jewel Shepherd house. Okay. Not so much a house party, but it's a house full. Let's just put it that way. Right. 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 Well, thank, thank you again you. for your time and uh, I'll be in touch, my dear. All right. Take care and goodbye, everybody. It was nice to see some yep. friendly faces out there. Stay safe. Yep. Bye.